Now, please give a warm welcome to our speaker, Mark Erickson. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Good afternoon. All right. Um, so the good news is, I guess, I just found out if you Google Mark Harrington now, you get the aviator in the sports store. A couple of years ago, it was a guy that was like, it clearly wasn't me, okay? Let me say that to start off with. Uh, by the picture, you can tell it wasn't me. But a guy had been convicted of murdering his wife. So uh, it feels like I've come a long way since then, thankfully. Um, made it kind of hard to get a date at that point in time. Um, <clears throat> so this is really fun for me. This is a lot better than work. Um, the only hard thing is I've been told I really can't stray from this podium um, because of the video, which is very unnatural for me. So pardon me if I fidget and so forth. But um, So I'm going to talk to you guys about uh, three things, really. I'm going to give you some idea about my background, and um, only because it's pretty uh, unusual, I think, or a little bit different. And uh, if I can um, kind of navigate through this crazy world and end up in a pretty cool place, like first aid of doing what I do, then pretty much anybody can. And I'll tell you about that. Um, secondly, I'm going to talk about innovation. Uh, innovation is often used word. We use it uh, in the industry. Everybody uses it in high technology, et cetera. So I'm going to give you some views and thoughts on innovation and then try to apply that uh, to what I do now for a living at First Data uh, as far as innovation and kind of a little bit of background on First Data and then come back to something very specific here, which is what's happening uh, in the marketplace from a commerce standpoint, most of you uh, being the drivers of what's happening and some of the changes that are happening in the commerce uh, world. I am going to ask for some participation. This seems like a pretty participatory crowd. So uh, if I ask for a show of hands, I'm doing some market research here too. So please uh, humor me on that. Um, so I, I was, grew up um, in Gulfport, Mississippi. Anybody ever heard of Gulfport? Yeah, about six people, I think. Um, and you would only know it if you probably tracked the, the path of the recent hurricanes um, that blew through New Orleans because Gulfport's right next to it. Uh, I'm the first person to ever graduate college on either side of my family, and that was uh, by a very thin margin that I did that. So um, I played tennis in college, and it took me a while to figure out that I actually needed to get a degree. So I played tennis in college, <laughs> and uh, then played for a year after that, trying to make a living, which uh, I figured out pretty quickly. My expenses were more than my prize money. So um, I started off as a clerk for five bucks an hour, telemarketing for a high-tech firm. Um, long story short, I spent 16 years in the high-tech uh, software space, uh, took three years off, and then fun founded Money Network. I did something that you're never supposed to do. I went into business with one of my best friends, a guy I had known since I was nine years old, and it actually worked out pretty well. He actually still works uh, as a part of my team at First Data, so that was fun. Um, uh, Money Network, probably most of you have not heard of that. It's a, uh, a company that we, we founded based on a couple of factors. Uh, one is this was just after the kind of the, the terrorist attacks on 9-11. On, uh, and what happened there was when everything was disrupted as far as the mail systems, um, people couldn't get paychecks to their employees. So AutoZone was a local company in Memphis that we knew very well and knew the, um, the management there. They actually had to put managers in, in AutoZone trucks and drive them all over the U.S. to deliver paychecks. Big problem. Um, second thing that we noticed um, was just the expense, overall expense associated with that in a good day. So just the distribution of paychecks, having to get people pay stubs. Um, most of you that work probably have never seen a paycheck. It goes directly to your, to your direct deposit, to your account. Um, but there are a lot of people in the country that don't have bank accounts. And so we looked at the expense associated with that. Also, it was aligned with most companies' sustainability initiatives, as most companies are trying to reduce their carbon footprint and, uh, and paper associated with that. Um, and then we, we noticed and we did research around underbanked and unbanked people uh, in this country. And they're somewhere estimated to be uh, about 28% of the households in the U.S. Uh, that work are termed to be underbanked or unbanked. What that means is they don't have a bank account uh, or access to financial services. So we came up with a product that uh, used very basic um, uh, available technology, a debit card. And we packaged it up in a way that we could go to... Um, an employer, uh, a couple of our first earlier customers were Dillard's, AutoZone was an, uh, an earlier employer, and we basically allowed them to completely eliminate uh, the checks that they wrote and distributed to their employees. Uh, a few years later, we signed Walmart, largest employer in the world, and now they're 100% paperless as it relates to paying their employees. 
The other thing we th that did was it gave access to mainstream financial services to about a million six hundred thousand people as of today that previously did not have access to financial services. They were the users of check cashers, uh, money stores, those types of things. Um, money Network, for the first four years, we uh, did virtually no revenue. Um, it was absolutely uh, from the ground up, myself and two other guys. Um, he, we were told many, many times that what we were doing uh, would not stand on its own two feet, that employers would never eliminate their checks. Uh, we ended up going into a joint venture with First Data. And the people that uh, we were working with at First Data, I'll never forget, the first guy I went in and talked to, who was, was supposed to be kind of the sponsor of what we were doing, said to me, um, this will never work. We've tried it many times before, it'll never work. And that's the guy that I had to deal with for about two years. And he literally kind of sort of did everything he could to prove himself right. Um, so it, it was not an easy path, but uh, we finally got a good sponsorship within, within First Data. We were able to get uh, into their distribution channel, which was 5,000 uh, salespeople around the US. And uh, two years later, we sold Money Network to First Data uh, for $230 million. So it was pretty cool. It took us uh, seven years, and um, it was uh, a great, great journey, very different. Um, be happy to talk more about that a little later. First Data, um, so I've been a part of First Data now for the last, uh, last five years, and uh, I'll talk, talk more about that in the presentation. Let me talk about innovation, and then I'm going to talk to you about innovation at First Data. So what's the definition of innovation? Anybody know? It's not real complicated, so take, take a wild guess if you want. Something new, right? That is literally, you look at the dictionary, it's introduction of something new. New idea, new method, new device. Um, creating value. What are the key attributes of uh, being able to innovate? Um, basically experience, life experiences, challenging the paradigms. Uh, if you look at some of the, the, the really neat technologies that are emerging today, you look at things like Twitter. You look at things like Square. Who's heard of Square? Quite a few. So Jack Dorsey, I've had a chance to spend some time with, uh, founder of Square, co-founder of Twitter, as well as Biz Stone, who was his co-founder at Twitter. Um, very, very interesting, uh, very interesting people. And the, the entrepreneurs, it kind of good demonstration illustrations of the entrepreneurs of, our, of your generation and the current generation. These guys think and girls think very, very differently. The, the current paradigms of anything, and I'll talk more about this as it relates to payments in a little while, they completely uh, reject. Um, Jack Dorsey founded uh, Square because he had a friend that owed him money and they were sitting there looking at each other and the guy didn't have any cash and he's like, there should be a way for me to be able to exchange value. And that's literally the idea that started Square. Um, the, current, the company was founded four years ago, currently valued at just over $3 billion. He just raised $300 million over the past two or three years from venture capitalists to fund his company. Very different perspective from these entrepreneurs. Um, so. Think outside the box, challenge thinking respectfully, challenge thinking, challenge the things that are, that are currently in the marketplace. Um, kind of make curiosity a part of your everyday uh, vernacular, your everyday habits. Just be really curious about you know, why things are the way they are. Uh, it really kind of is what leads oftentimes to the best ideas, uh, no matter what it is. And the payments industry, which I'm now a part of, has, has seen almost no change literally for the past 40 years. We're going to see more change in the next three to five years in the space, the payments industry around commerce than we've seen collectively in the last 40 years. And that's because people like Jack Dorsey and folks like uh, the folks at PayPal and other places are bringing a completely different experience to the users relative to consumer experience. Um, be relentless in your ideas. If you believe in something, be relentless towards that. Um, you know, most people that have ever come up with something really, really good will tell you that a lot of people told them it was a bad idea. So don't let that discourage you. Um, don't be, you know, over some period of time, you got to figure out if you're right or not. But um, be, be, very, be very persistent and relentless in pursuing your ideas. A lot of discussion that goes on around taking risk. Um, you know, people tell me I'm a risk taker. Um, I'm not sure why. I mean, I, I've done a few things. I'm a pilot. Um, I raced cars, raced in the Baja 1000, which actually was a very scary thing in a dune buggy. Um, but um, for me, those things weren't, they weren't real, real uh, risky. 
But you know, risk, I think, is something that you have to be willing to take. Uh, you have to be willing to fail. You learn a lot from your failures. You learn what to do, what not to do uh, if you take risk. Um, the only thing I'll say about failure is do it fast. You know, we have a saying in my group at, at First Aid, and it's not an original term. It's uh, many people follow the same uh, philosophy: is if you fail fast, don't hang on to an idea beyond when you know it's really not a good idea, uh, whatever it might be. Um, fail fast is, is a, a common thread. Okay, excuse me. Um, also, last thing on that is celebrate success. Um, momentum is a very powerful thing in anything that you do in life. Business, sports, um, you see it in sports kind of most notably. You watch it happening in any of the series, the Super Bowls, the World Series. Uh, you follow your favorite uh, rambling rec team through a season. And you know sometimes you have momentum, sometimes you don't. It's very hard to get. It's hard to maintain. But recognize when you have it and, and ride that. Um, so it's really important to celebrate success. Uh, you're going to have some failures, but you're also going to have some successes. OK, first data. Um, Innovation of first data, what's happening with a connected consumer. How many people in this room uh, use their mobile phone to actually do research for what they might buy somewhere? Pretty big percent. How many actually buy things with your mobile phone? So um, this has changed the entire landscape of what's happening as far as people like your favorite retailers, whether it be Best Buy, whether it be Target, whether it be you pick your pick the fill in the name there, McDonald's, um, all the folks uh, online, all the Ebay's of the world, and so forth, uh, Amazon's. Um, there is a global. This is not just something that's happening in the U.S. It's a global phenomenon. I've been in 20 countries so far this year, and there's a consistent theme. Virtually every single place you go that has an open economy, and that is that the consumer is becoming much much more empowered to be able to shop where they want, how they want, when they want, pay for stuff how they want. All sort of originating from here. So um, at First Data, we were faced with a pretty interesting challenge. Um, we have a company that, as I said, grew for 40, uh, for 40 years through buying other companies, which means we really didn't have um, an organization that really knew how to build stuff, invent stuff there. We bought it. Uh, we bought our way to about a $10 billion revenue on an annualized basis company. We have somewhere close to half of the market share in the United States relative to accepting payments that aren't cash. How many of you have ever heard of First Data before today? That's more than I thought. It's actually one of the, one of the brands, one of the least known brands for a Fortune 200 company in the US. Um, largely because we go to market with partnerships like Bank of America, uh, Wells Fargo, uh, SunTrust Bank, et cetera. But uh, the chances are pretty good that one every two times that you go somewhere and pay for something that's not cash, it's going through a first data system. Uh, about 70 billion times a year, about $2 trillion is what we move around. Um, but having a company that's, that's great, great scale, great size, do business in 60 countries, 38 countries we have presence in, that's all good. However, these technologies that are now coming into the payment space have proven to be very, very disruptive and actually a, a, a tremendous threat to our core business where we actually have that um, access to those payments at the point of sale. All these new companies and technologies, if we don't respond very quickly, uh, are a very, very serious threat to that. I and mean, you've seen it in history. You know, I'm not sure how much you guys cover in some of the classes and so forth, but there are plenty of great companies that have fallen by the wayside over time uh, for the very same reason. Uh, very big, very successful technology shifts, something changes, companies doesn't exist anymore. Uh, there are also some that make the transition amazingly. The one I always like to use is Corning. How many of you have ever heard of Corning? So back in the early 1900s, mid-1900s, they made dishes. Today, they, they make the majority of their money from fiber optics and displays. So getting from dishes to fiber optics and displays is probably a pretty interesting journey, um, which is probably worth doing some research on. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to talk to you about, um, in, in a few minutes, the, the, the connected consumer. Um, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit more after that for a few minutes about kind of what, what, what we did to take that environment that I described to you which is this 40-year-old company, never really built products organically, didn't really have the function that I now fill, which is global product management. The function didn't exist. So after I go through these next few slides, I'll share with you a little bit about how we, we brought that about. OK, this is simply to say that um, it might be surprising to you, only about 7% of, of purchasing today happens online. 
only about 7%. It's a lot smaller than I thought it was when I first got into the space. It is growing at about mm, 20% a year in terms of growth. And so what this, show, this slide shows you uh, on the right-hand side of this, just the big, the big piece of the pie that's going to move is going to be the piece that is, uh, it, that is um, consumers buying solely either with their handset, their mobile phone, or buying online. Okay, so there's a convergence right now that's happening. A lot of us go online and shop, then go into a store and buy something. Um, a lot of us go into a store and shop, and then go online and buy it. There was an article in the Wall Street Journal recently that, and, and I hope not to offend anybody here, I love Best Buy, but an uh, article in the Wall Street Journal that referred to Best Buy as Amazon's showroom. So, um, but the face of retail is changing. Uh, what these, these, these retailers are very, very concerned um, Amazon has done an amazing job of selling just about everything but groceries at this point. Um, so there's a lot of concern about that. And these technology trends are what's driving that, obviously. So you're going to continue to see that. This basically says that you'll see a doubling, which is a fairly short period of time, of uh, e-commerce and mobile commerce over the course of the next uh, seven or eight years. OK. Uh, oops. I heard the Coca-Cola guy put it right there, which is probably a better place for it. Um, so about 84% of consumers uh, decide what they will buy before entering the store. How many of you guys generally go online and do research and look at what it is you're, you're thinking about buying before you go in the store? That's probably close to 7 to 80%, so that's consistent. Um, how many of you guys are influenced by what you see here, read about, talk about with your friends on Facebook or Twitter? So point being here is what we're starting to see is a major convergence of not only online and offline, the social media thing has taken uh, a really front stage, center stage impact on people's buying behavior. Yeah, you're going to see probably very quickly, um, you know, most everybody in this room probably has a Facebook account. You, know, you already have Facebook currency. I've heard you know, people talk about five years from now that some, significant, you know, some percentage of online purchases in the US will be done with a Facebook credit. You know, who knows? But um, clearly, the social media sites are, are uh, very, very relevant. The other thing that's changed dramatically from a standpoint of empowering consumers is the fact that a consumer can voice their opinion perspective very, very quickly uh, and be broadcast around the world. How many of you guys heard about the, uh, the Alaska Airlines wouldn't let the guy on the plane that was handicapped, supposedly? Not as many as I thought. OK, I looked at that stuff too much, obviously. But um, it lit up Twitter. I mean, it lit up Twitter, it lit up Facebook, and everybody was all up in arms about this uh, Alaska. So you have a brand, a really good brand, actually, Alaska Airlines, all of a sudden kind of thrown, thrown in the ditch, and probably rightfully so, given the, the example there. My point is that the consumers, um, as we look at this, this road that we're going to travel relative to how you buy, how you shop, how you pay, it's going to be driven by you guys. It's going to be driven by people that decide how it is they want to pay. There was an announcement uh, that came out uh, about three weeks ago where uh, I think about 16 of the top retailers in the US announced something called MCX. And what it is is basically they're coming together to propose a standard of what they're going to accept relative to mobile payments. There's a very long story behind why they're doing that. But my point is I'm very um, intrigued by that to see whether or not how, I guess, how much fortitude they have to try to impose a certain behavior or a certain form factor onto consumer versus what the consumer's reaction that's going to be. I think consumers are going to react very, very negatively to that. Um, I think consumers are going to want an open environment for what they want to do. They're going to want to pay how they want to pay with whatever they want to pay with. So a lot of things happening in the, in the marketplace right now as it relates to retail and commerce that's trying to adapt to and adjust to the things I talked about in the previous two slides. Um, so really the point here is to kind of summarize all that is that, that the, the purchasing process today is much more complex than it was even five or ten years ago. People are influenced historically, heavy advertising, print advertising, I went too far, print advertising, TV advertising, 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 advertising. Um, then kind of I thought about what I might want to go and then I went and bought it. Obviously today, um, a lot of different influences. One of the most recent ones, interesting, again, to talk about how fast things are changing, um, how many people in this room have used a Groupon? How many people have used some type of coupon online? So Groupon didn't exist three and a half years ago. 
They went public a year ago with about a $20 billion market capitalization as a company. Didn't exist. Um, honestly, this is one of those that really kind of you know, gnaws at me because quite frankly, if companies like First Data would have been minding the shop, um, we would have been providing those types of services to our smaller merchants who wanted to attract and retain new customers. But my point to this is, is with Groupon obviously being influential, media sites are being, or social sites are being influential, so the advertisers are having a heck of a time trying to figure out the best way to, to reach you. Um, I don't like ads, generally speaking. It produces a tremendous amount of money for a lot of companies, but like, you know, I'm sure I'm like most of you, it's really annoying. And what these companies are trying to figure out now is how to do that in the least obtrusive way, and also to do it in a way that serves you up relevant stuff, right? I don't need any more bikini waxes from uh, Groupon, right? I mean, I had enough of those. Um, you know, and so basically, you know, we've got to get to the place where if we're going to be entertaining that type of stuff on Facebook, which, you know, these companies, to monetize what they do, you're going to, you're going to get advertised, ads served up to you. Uh, what they're all trying to figure out is the best way to do that. The other thing they're trying to figure out to do is how to associate what you do when you're online and have that correlate to did that actually drive you to buy something. So just to give you an idea of what people are trying to figure out about what you're doing. All right, I'm going to play a video here. This is uh, kind of, I try to take things that are fairly complex and break them down into something that I can understand or my 10-year-old twins could understand. So this next video is, uh, is our attempt to do that. This is a story of commerce, how the way we buy is changing. Consumers today want it all. They expect the best deal in the most convenient and personalized way and to be connected anywhere, all the time. At First Data, we call this universal commerce. For a long time, people didn't have much control over how, when, or where they shopped. They'd visit a store and determine if they were willing to pay the asking price. Then came e-commerce, which brought greater power and choice. Buying online or in a store, however, were initially very different experiences. The more recent emergence of smart, connected mobile devices merged these two worlds and created m-commerce. The convergence of offline shopping and e-commerce through m-commerce has created a new world of universal commerce, where consumers expect a more integrated buying experience that's quick and consistent, wherever they are and at any time. Imagine this. Your neighbor needs to buy a birthday present for his daughter. He gets an email alert with a recommended deal on a jacket. He looks it up, reads reviews online, checks pricing, and places the item with the best price in his virtual shopping cart. Later, as he approaches his local mall while running errands, he gets an alert on his smartphone that one of the stores has the item in stock and will give him a better price if he gets it now. At checkout, he selects his credit card in his mobile wallet and waves to pay using his loyalty points. As he continues his errands, he pulls up the Starbucks app on his phone to order his favorite latte. On his way, he selects his preferred payment method from his phone and when he arrives, the drink is waiting on the counter and already paid for. He walks past the line, grabs his drink and leaves, all in under a minute. In a reality of increasing consumer expectations, payments are lagging behind. To become and remain relevant, merchants and financial institutions need to adapt quickly. So how will they keep pace with such rapid change and deliver a completely integrated experience? To make e-commerce a reality, we need four ingredients. First, the broad development and adoption of a variety of smart devices that allow consumers to be connected anytime to the things that they need and want. Next, a growing ecosystem of partners to develop new, more creative ways to satisfy consumers' needs. New relationships must be forged between merchants, FIs, device manufacturers, application developers, payment networks, and other emerging participants. Everything needs to be integrated virtually with new applications and technologies to deliver a consistent and seamless buying experience for consumers wherever they are. This will pave the way for new innovations that can influence and evolve their decision cycle. All this has to plug into an enabling infrastructure that's open and can scale globally while keeping pace with new technology. It has to be secure and function smoothly in order to create an experience that's predictable and personal. The age of universal commerce is already upon us, full of promise and potential. And in a world of endless options, First Data e-commerce solutions can make it all possible. Okay, that makes sense. So all my team has to do is figure out how to do that. And how to do it in a way that's as simple as 
we have today where we all know what to do with this, right? That seven, that, that hourly um, wage employee or cashier um, that probably has, you know, two or three jobs a year in different places has to know exactly what to do like they do with this. So you start showing up with this, a mobile phone with different types of payment options, different types of form factors, payment types, um, it gets very, very complicated. So the interesting thing about this is um, we, as a, a market leader in this space, are working with just about everybody you can imagine. Uh, you name it relative to the social networks, you name it relative to the financial institutions, the top merchants. Um, and the challenge we all have is to be able to bring that consistent user experience to you, the market, and the merchants. Because what's not going to work are people walking up and having to do different things in different stores. And what's not going to work is a cashier having to figure out whether you have this phone or an iPhone or whatever else you might have and be able to do different things. So this, what I just described to you, is very much possible today. Everything I talked to you about is current, and you probably used or have you know, seen or been exposed to certain parts of what you saw in that video. Um, so there's nothing that's crazy high tech about this. Um, it just happens to be something that's going to be very difficult to get across the U.S., across, forget, forget outside the U.S. for the time being, it's more complicated. The U.S. is a pretty homogeneous environment. Even having said that, getting this in place is going to take probably uh, the better part of the next few years. Um, with first data, there was a, a lot of folks that have felt like we didn't need to even pay much attention to this, that the squares of the world and the Jack Dorseys of the world, that stuff's just for small merchants. That was uh, about uh, 18 months ago. And then today, you just saw where Square announced a, a deal with Starbucks and got $25 million from Starbucks and another $175 million in funding for somebody, from other sources. There are billions and billions of dollars being put into this space as we speak. Um, all of you are too young to remember the heydays of the, or maybe you can have read about them, the, of the uh, 90s and the technology boom that went on, the internet boom that went on in the 90s. It was a lot of fun uh, while it lasted. I was right in the middle of it. Um, crazy things were happening, though. We were supposedly all of a sudden going to buy everything we could ever think about buying online. Pets.com was going to sell you pets online, seriously. Um, you know, and so what emerged out of all that craziness was kind of some really cool stuff like Amazon. Uh, which was very much uh, long-term sustainable. Um, we're in a very similar period as it relates to technology. And uh, I spent a fair amount of time out on the West Coast with um, a lot of the top venture capital firms that are putting these billions of dollars to work. And you would be shocked at the amount of money and the different ideas and the number of companies that are popping up. I mean, it really does feel very similar to how it felt, what's that, 13, 14 years ago. Um, you get companies that didn't exist a year ago or 18 months ago, like Instagram, get sold to Facebook for a billion dollars, right? I mean, two guys, you know, sitting in their apartment, founded a company and uh, created that much value in you know that shorter period of time. So it's a great time to be coming. Quite frankly, uh, no matter where you are in the in your uh, you know what year you are in your studies, um, the next you know four to five to seven years, I think, is going to be a great time to be uh, entering the job market. There's a lot of opportunities, a lot of technology, um, a lot of really cool stuff happening out there. So uh, at First Data, we're very committed. We've done some things very differently in the course of the last year. We put uh, an actual innovation lab in place, nothing we'd ever done before. We uh, brought in uh, six interns last summer, this past summer, and just had them sit and pound on the social sites, all the various applications they could download, you know, the scout mobs and every type of deal you could possibly find and tell us what they liked, tell us what they didn't like. Uh, because at the end of the day, what we as a company and our industry is figuring out very quickly is you guys are going to decide what the answer ends up being as far as what you like and don't like and how you want to shop and how you want to pay. Uh, a lot of effort going into influencing uh, how you pay. Billions of dollars in advertising spent by Visa, MasterCard, American Express, the banks. Um, but you know, my suspicion is, not suspicion, I, I firmly believe, that um, as we go forward, the, the platforms that are going to win relative to mobile technology, relative to payment types, are going to be the open platforms, the things that give you the absolute choice to buy how you want to buy, where you want to buy, when you want to buy. Any attempts to manipulate your behavior or habits for selfish reasons by a merchant or someone else, I think you're going to get met um, with a tremendous amount of uh, resistance. So uh, we're very excited. It's a great time, like I said, to be in the space. 
Um, there's a lot of great companies that are uh, spending a ton of money hiring a lot of people. So um, you know, hopefully it's uh, something that you guys might consider. It's a great place to be for the next number of years. So with that, I'll uh, conclude my comments. I'm happy to sit and answer questions as long as you guys have them. And I think we've got uh, a couple of microphones too. So. Hi, my name is Piyasha. I'm a business student. Um, my question is, in the video, um, it showed that the guy, he ordered a Starbucks online, or not online, on his phone, and then, he, like, in less than a minute, he got his drink. But what happens if, like, in a few years, everyone kind of figures out that, you know, they can skip the line and get their drink on their phone? Then do you think the idea becomes less effective? Yes, that's a good example of Starbucks, because we know it doesn't take just a minute, right, to get it. Um, Unfortunately, and you know, I think you know, I, 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 it's an interesting case study for me. Starbucks is a good example that you bring. What you'll see are store formats will change to accommodate kind of the lane busting concept. Um, they will completely change the format of the stores. They're going to have to because otherwise, you know, it, they're they're trying to solve a problem which says people are queuing up, you know, and having to wait ten minutes to get a cup of coffee. I, anytime I'm in a big city, um, I pretty much avoid Starbucks uh, in the morning because as many times as not, I'll turn around and walk out. I was in New York a few weeks ago. I mean, <laughs> it was just it looked hideous. It might not have been, but it looked absolutely hideous. So you know, I think that uh, again, I think it's going to be if. What will happen is, is if, if that experience is not good, if you don't enjoy that experience, doesn't make your experience better, and you walk out going, that was great, then they, they, they're going to have failed. And there will be, based on the type of merchant, I mean, Starbucks is one good example. McDonald's will be doing the same thing. They're going, you'll see this in the next you know, 24 months probably where you can do remote ordering, and then based on geolocation on your GPS, they'll know where you are, and they'll either have a drive-through specifically uh, for that, or they'll have a line, you know, a very specific line. But it's a good question. I mean, it's yet to be seen as exactly how it's all going to transform. But um, you're going to see, you're, and I think the, good, the, the cool thing is, is the companies are going to be willing to try stuff. Um, because there's no way to know if you got it just right until you actually put it out there. And you're going to see a lot of companies trying a lot of different things to, to make your shopping experience more pleasurable. And they actually use the word delightful a lot for whatever reason. I don't know. Hi, I'm uh, Jacob. I'm a fourth year biomedical engineer. Um, and you really stress the importance of like adapting and innovating quickly. Uh, and in your experience, have you seen that it's more difficult or just what are the differences between adapting and innovating at a big, large, established corporation like First Data versus a startup like Money Network? Yeah, you have to have a lot thicker skin um, in the First Data example. So uh, uh, another really good question. The, um, you know, the great thing about being having your own company is you can do whatever you want. Right? And so you can absolutely move as fast as you want to. Um, fortunately, my timing at First Data was pretty real. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be here doing what I did if I didn't have the ability and my team didn't have the ability to do that. I mean, it's just, just not a good fit, right? Um, so the, um, what, what happened, though, was First Data, when they, the same time, about three months after they bought my company from me, they were taken private by K uh, KKR, large private equity firm. So all of a sudden, we had a lot of debt. Very shortly after that, um, we had the worst economic crisis, hopefully, that we'll ever see in our lifetime. And those two things, you know, just completely highlighted the necessity for us to figure out how to invent and build stuff uh, internally to our company. And if we didn't do it, I mean, there was a, enough smart people with a lot of money invested that realized if we didn't do this, we would absolutely be a dinosaur at some point in time. Now, even with everybody knowing it, um, you know, basically my organization was like putting a new organ in the body, you know, and there was was and continue to be attempts to reject the organ. Um, just culturally, uh, doing things differently, no matter what it is, people resist change. We have 26,000 employees, um, a lot of tenure. We have people who have been with the company 30, you know, 30 years and 35 years. And so um, there, there's always a resistance to change. I don't care. In, in any size of organization, people just naturally just don't like it uh, in, in most cases. Now, you can build it into your culture if you have the chance to do that from the beginning. A lot of companies do an amazing job of that, right? Um, you go to an Apple or you go to any of these high-tech firms, they do a great job. But uh, it's different. It is different. You have to be, uh, you have to be very aware. You have to um, build alliances you know, and try to make sure you build the right alliances because someone's going to be against what you're doing. Um, and then most importantly, I would say you have to stay really true and aligned to the company's stated goal and mission. And kind of pure to that, 
So when you're doing things and somebody gets mad at you or doesn't like it, you're able to just kind of take the high ground of, look, this is you know, what we've been given as a task to do. But uh, it's certainly not without its challenges, I'll tell you that. Hi, my name is Jalise. I'm an industrial and systems engineering master's student. And I wanted to know your thoughts on the effect of combining a lot of these technologies and synchronizing a lot of the processes across the businesses. And what effect will it have on you know, personal security and identity theft? Yeah, I, sh I should have mentioned that. Um, the, the, uh, there is going to be a tremendous amount of activity around the subject of privacy. Um, and it's uh, it's a little scary, quite honestly, just what all is collected on us. You know, me included. That you know, I, I don't even know still as close as I am to the space. Um, and it's going to be you're you're going to see a reaction out of Washington. You've already started to see some of it, but you're going to see um, reaction very swift. Uh, no matter who's in office, no matter which you know party's in office around this whole notion of privacy, people just take it really seriously. Um, you know, th there's there's two schools of thoughts on it. You know, one is is that the generation, the younger generations that are coming up, are much more adventurous, you know, with their cred payment credentials as a as an example, and willing to put their credit cards online and you know whatever else. Um, you know, I think that's probably true until there's some adverse event or something that happens that all of a sudden you know you become aware of. And um, again, I think the, 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 the ease to communicate and spread any bad experiences will cause this to be a real kind of top of the, top of the heap issue for all of us. Um, and what's going to happen is, is, to me very clearly, is people are going to have to get your permission um, to use any data that you, you know, they might want to try to use to market to you, to find out your habits. They're going to have to get your permission. The other thing you have to do is you have to get the retailer's permission to use data as well. Um, but it's going to, the lines, it's, it's going to get very blurry. Uh, and it already is. I mean, you look at Google and some of the stuff that was going on there, right? I mean, I love Google and use it all the time. But, uh, you know, they were getting stuff out, you know, from mail and just about everywhere, and the government told them to stop. But, uh, you know, it's going to be one of the most controversial topics, and it will determine a lot about who ends up doing really, really well in some of this stuff and who doesn't, and particularly who you're going to trust. I think it's going to come down to, to kind of, and that's where I think a lot of people say the financial institution, the banks are really at risk of losing their customers to other, you know, influences. You know, there are people that still trust their banks to hold their money, um, you know, in large part. So um, we'll see what happens. Hi, hi, Mark. Uh, I'm TJ. I'm a fourth year computer science major. Um, and you talked earlier about, I think it was you were talking about money network still, um, and you said you had a guy who told you this has been, this has been done before has never worked it's not going to work um, so two questions um, one what differentiated you that actually like made it work and the second thing is what were the most important things that you did to kind of overcome his negativity and like want to make it not work yeah um, so the um, so the first part of the question um, being you know kind of we, we had a value proposition that was fairly unique, and, and it was really nuanced, okay? Because what we, what we did was uh, there was some people that had started to kind of try to, to provide these payroll cards, and, and I mean, there's a ton of them out there. There's a rush card, you know, from, um, you know, I can't remember the guy's name, um, but there's, there's a ton of these prepaid cards out there in the marketplace, Green Dot, NetSpin, you can buy them off the shelves in stores and stuff like that. Um, they had just started to come up back, this was in 2001. But you know, our thought was, and a lot of people are going to these companies and saying, yeah, I can give you a payroll card. Well, there are a lot of, without getting into a lot of gory detail, there's some very specific um, legislation that each state has as to how you have to pay your employees and what's required of the employer. Some say you have to give them a check and provide them with a place to cash it, right? And so uh, some say that you cannot mandate direct deposit to your employees. Some say you can mandate direct deposit to your employees. So what we had to do is kind of take a view that said, you know, number one, and this was really the key point, um, was we're going we're gonna to solve this problem completely, okay? Because people had kind of taken bits and bytes of it. You know, they had given the payroll card, but the employer still had to send a payroll, a pay stub to the employee. Even if they were getting direct deposit, they still got a pay stub in the mail. Um, this was before things became as electronic as they are today. Um, so that was one issue that we said we have to solve for that. So we came up with a way to provide a pay stub that somebody could get from a, a point of sale terminal, 
in a store. So if you work for Walmart, you could walk up, they had a terminal in the break areas, different locations, you could walk up, swipe your card, put in your pen, and they would say print a, print, print a pay stub. So we solved for that. The second one was there are states that require you to be able to, like I said earlier, there are states that say you have to provide uh, an employee access to their money via a check. So we came up with a variant of a check that was attached to the account and provided them with places to cash it, and so we solved for that. But these were all, I mean, we probably spent four million bucks over four or five years with lawyer, legal fees just to get the state stuff down right. Um, and then, you know, like anything else, you know, we, you know the, the guy that was the doubter, you know, once you start building momentum and start having success, those, those people all of a sudden get pretty quiet. He actually got fired, but. Um, <laughs> First, enjoyed your presentation. Thank you. Uh, as you can probably see, I'm a baby boomer. And my question is, while a lot of us try to embrace technology as it changes, uh, what's the strategy for those people who are baby boomers who don't embrace technology but have a tremendous amount of purchasing power? Uh, how does that fit into your strategy? Yeah, and none of this is going to happen uh, at the flip of a switch, right? None of this is going to be kind of an on-off binary equation. It's going to happen over time. and you know, there were people 30 years ago that said checks were going away. Um, and guess what? You know, a buddy of mine's always guy I work with uses the example of his dad. You know, going to buy gas is like an all day, half day experience for his dad. Goes to the gas station, still writes a check, right? Um, so the way we do things today isn't going to vanish overnight. Um, and what's going to happen is, you know, even the baby boomers, I mean, most of I mean, you, you've got an iPad, you know, in your lap. My mom's just had a 71st birthday. She's got iPad, she just ordered for her birthday the new iPhone 5 and is bugging the crap out of me to make sure she gets it. And, um, you know, so, you know, the, I think that you're going to see people, you know, recognize that the, there, there's going to be segmentation. Um, they're going to make it attractive and compelling for you to, you know, use those devices to do your shopping or to find your deals or whatever. And uh, there, there are going to be people who do it really well. Um, so, but no one's going to ever, you know, again, what you're not going to find happening anytime in the future, in the near future, is anybody telling you how you have to do something. I think people that try to do that are, you know, they're going to be met with a resounding negative reaction to that. Hi, Mark. My name is Elias. I'm an undergraduate accounting oh, yeah. student up oh, here. They are. Okay, cool. um, and this question actually deals really closely with his, but I was wondering um, with the convergence of all these e-commerce and e-payment you know, payment opportunities. Could you paint a picture of us, of um, the future of the dollar and just hard money as a way of paying for things? Yeah, I touched on it a little bit um, with uh, the Facebook example, talking about Facebook credits, right? Um, and you're already seeing you know, currencies kind of sort of pop up that are game related. You know, my son's a master of a couple of these games. He's 10 years old and it just baffles me some of the stuff he comes up with and where he, you know, these games he plays. But, um, you know, I, I don't think the dollar as an underlying currency, you know, I'm not smart enough to figure out anything that really happens. I, I don't see us going to a gold, going back to gold or any material like that. So you have to have an underlying currency. But uh, I do absolutely see the trend continuing and probably um, quickening around kind of alternate forms of payment. Um, you know, you got, um, like I said, the, the online guys, the gamers, the uh, Facebook will do it. You know, it wouldn't surprise me. Eventually, you know, Apple could very easily have a currency through iTunes. Um, there's, there, and there's a, there's a drive towards that predominantly to eliminate uh, some of the costs associated with accepting uh, credit cards. There's, I don't know if you know, most of you probably may or may not know, but I mean, it's fairly costly, which is why Walmart and some of these big merchants, you know, fight so hard against Visa and MasterCard and the associations in many cases. They pay, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in fees to those, to those associations um, to be able to accept those cards. And so, you know, that's going to be probably the driver from the merchant side of the equation. Um, you know, again, um, the, the one that comes to mind for me, the most kind of obvious to me right now is Facebook, given the, the user population they have. Mark, my name is Luke Snyder. I'm a for former student here at the co College of Management. When it was, it's College of Business now. But two quick questions for you. How is your tennis game now with tra traveling so much? And will we carry wallets in the future? Yeah, my tennis game, um, unfortunately, is, is pretty bad. Um, 
you know, my mind still knows what I want my body to do, but my body just hasn't cooperated very well. Um, so I did tar start playing a lot of squash when I lived in Chicago at one point in time, which is a ton of fun. But no, right now with, uh, with work, travel, I uh, 10-year-old twins, so between baseball and gymnastics and all that, that's all kind of gone by the wayside a little bit. That's, that's okay, though. Um, you will not have a wallet. No, you're going to, I mean, it's going to be, and you're already seeing it, I mean, with the pass, with Passbook, uh, kind of Apple's latest piece there, you know, you're going to carry all your credentials that are going to be in the phone. Um, you're going to be, you already, there's already technology to allow you to um, have access to, you know, buildings and access control to your homes. There's locks already available that can do all that kind of stuff. Um, so I, I can't see any reason why you're going to want to carry a wallet, you know. I, I'm going to say the, all those technologies will be available for you less than five years. I mean, kind of on a broad base usage, so, which, um, I mean, right now, all I carry is this and some cash and a couple of credit cards and my driver's license. I mean, kind of already got most of everything I do on, on here. There's a, there's a big, you know, that, that's a good question. So just to kind of make a point there, um, the, one of the big questions in the space that we're in right now that keeps coming up, I get asked every single time I go uh, present to a group of investors um, or other groups that say, who's going to win the wallet war? Um, how many people in here have downloaded the Google wallet? Okay, it's relatively small. Um, interestingly, we're actually the first data developed the ability to provision uh, debit and credit cards into that wallet with, with Google. So um, very few people even know that. But um, the, the wallet is, is interesting. There's a lot, of, a lot of money going into it. MasterCard just came out with their wallet. Um, Google's got their wallet. Um, Visa's got their wallet. And so you're going to have this, this huge um, you know, kind of plethora of wallets that are going to pop out there. My view is um, you're not going to want to deal with more than you know, a wallet. Um, you may have, you know, you may want to have a couple of those store brands that you're really, you know, loyal to and you do a lot of business with that have their own kind of way to get you interacting. But generally speaking, um, this is one person's opinion. It's going to have to be an open wallet. You know, Visa has, again, their wallet. What are the chances that you're going to have a Visa wallet and in that wallet they're not going to try to direct you towards using a Visa product to pay for your goods, right? So... Um, Hello. Oh, my name is Bilal. I'm a third year biochemistry major. And my question is with all the payments and money being centralized, so how do you balance simplicity and security? Like if everyone's paying with just their phone, what if they lose their phone? Yeah, the, the interesting thing is, and uh, I forgot the precise um, numbers, but I'm directionally correct. You know, people realize they lost their phone about 10 times faster than they realize they lost their wallet. <laughs> um, so implicit in that what I just said, says this is probably more secure. Um, you'll have password protection on the front kind of entry. That's your choice. There'll always be password protection on the wallets. Uh, the other thing is, is you know, given the fact that you realize you, will, you lost your wallet that, that quickly, um, there'll be very easy capabilities to be able to go in and have your phone either locked or erased or whatever it might be. That it's basically all that stuff is on a chip. Uh, and it's called near-field communications chip. And uh, the technology already exists to be able to go in and wipe that chip. It's actually, you know, I can make the argument based on what I just said, it's a lot more secure than, you know, me carrying this around, uh, you know, these credit cards around my wallet. Um, the other part of it is, is that, you know, there are skimming technologies for credit cards. You guys may or may not know this, but, you know, people have devised these devices that go in, they sit them inside ATMs where they actually have the ability to skim your MagStripe data off your credit card, transmit it to some guy or girl sitting in a car in the parking lot, and they go off, they sell that somewhere across the world, and they go off and print a bunch of credit. I mean, that happens today. So I think you're actually going to see an enhanced level of security associated with this. Sure, that's the last question. Oh, I don't think I should be the last question. All right. Let me ask it, and then you'll ask, you'll ask another one. Okay. Uh, and I guess my question is not about technology, it's about the uh, organization. From listening to your presentation, I said, wow, so I went onto the website and uh, oh, no. looked around and then saw your vision and your uh, mission and your values, particularly the one about enjoy the journey, uh, you know, succeed with the diverse global team. And then I went to the leadership team. And um, I'm, I'm wondering about this unintended 
intended signal of these 13 white men that are looking at me from the, webs uh, the website. Uh, is this an unintended signal? What does it mean for women in technology in the future of uh, yeah. first, first yeah. data? And, and yeah. what a great place it is to really work. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so hopefully it's only eight people, unless we gain some executive. Well, there's the five, uh, okay. There's, a, there's, a, um, there's the eight people and the five on the board. Oh, okay, okay, <laughs> okay. So, um, it, it, so you're not the first person to ask that question, obviously. And uh, we get, we actually, I had a call yesterday um, with our HR folks, and we we do have a, a very um, determined uh, diversity program underway. You know, this, like it or not, this industry has been predominantly, you know, dominated by by males uh, historically. Just going back 40 years, you know, bankers and, and males. Um, I would tell you on my team, I have um, I have eight direct reports. And out of the eight, only three are white males. So I mean, that's just that's my my own personal uh, side of the equation. I'm one of the executive committee members that you're talking about. You know, it's not something that you can go out and you know kind of wave a magic wand and fix overnight. I, I'll tell you, it's really it's a very serious subject uh, with our CEO John Judge. He was 25 years at IBM. He worked with a company called Paychex and uh, payroll processing and providing. So you know, it's clearly top of mind for us. Uh, my HR. Person lead is actually the head of the diversity council at First Data, and uh, you can expect to see us continue uh, to work in that regard. So, I really appreciate the candor and yeah, absolutely. So Alexandria's here. Hello, Alexandria. Hi, um, I'm a fifth year industrial and systems engineering major. On a larger scale, I was wondering is this type of technology going to help with global transactions, or do you think it's going to make it harder? Because currently, if you travel, not all of your cards work. Yeah. Um, so I think the thing that will help with this um, other technology that's coming that I haven't talked about is called EMV. It's where you have the chip that's in the card. It's very uh, prevalent in Europe and other places around the world. Not rolled out here in the U.S. yet. So that's where a lot of people get in their problems, where they leave here and go elsewhere and they try to use their, their current card. Most banks now will give you um, a um, uh, shipped card now if you ask for it, if you're traveling. Um, what you're going to see most likely, the Visa and MasterCard and the associations are the ones who kind of determine the rules that you have to play by. They have come out and said that um, you, these banks, the banks are the ones who issue the cards to you, right? And so they've said to the banks that you have to be EMV uh, capable, compatible by starting in next year, starting in 2013. And they've got a rollout plan that gives people to like 15 or 16, I think, because it's, it's hundreds of millions of cards that have to be replaced at, a, at a, you know billions of dollars of expense, so uh, but you'll see more. My you now there's a, there's a big debate over will that happen or not, and I, my my perspective is is that NFC will happen. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, EMV will happen. It's a more secure payment. It basically ends up having some technology in the chip that makes the the card number somewhat random, so it's much harder to to try to commit fraud and and theft. Well, Mark, we thank Mark. We thank you very much. My pleasure.